Are you, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, we are going to uh, start now. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our uh, last uh, high energy last seminar. And uh, yeah, uh, today uh, we are very happy to have uh, uh, Javier, Dr. Javier Garcia, to here to talk about uh, uh, a high energy uh, X ray prop concept, HexP. And uh, uh, Dr. Garcia received his uh, 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 bachelor degree in physics from uh, Tulia University and also master degree in physics from uh, Venezuelan Institute for Scientific Research. In 2010, he received his PhD in physics from the Catholic University of America, working with Dr. Timothy uh, Kalman from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Dr. Garcia was a research associate at the University of Maryland before becoming a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in 2012. He then moved to Caltech as a postdoctoral uh, scholar and was appointed research assistant professor at Caltech in 2019. And Dr. Garcia was also appointed senior Alexander Wan Humboldt uh, fellow in 2016, working at the Dr. Karl Reimisch Observatory in Germany. In 2021, Dr. Garcia received the laboratory, uh, laboratory astrophysics uh, early career award from the AIS. Dr. Garcia is a member of the science teams for New Star and the Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer, and currently serves as the project scientist of the probe class mission concept HexP. And uh, uh, please feel free also to meet with uh, uh, Javier. Uh, he had multiple uh, openings this afternoon, and um, you can also uh, uh, contact him in, uh, via emails. So the floor is yours, Javier. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for being here. I'm, I'm very sorry I cannot be there in person. I, it was impossible for me to, to make the trip this week, but I didn't want to pass the opportunity to, to tell you about this exciting mission that we're currently working on. Um, so obviously, this is a talk on behalf of uh, a very large group of people. Uh, I'm just a messenger, so any, any horrible things that you might hear or wrong things are my entirely my fault and a misrepresentation of the hard work of uh, a lot of uh, very inspiring and great people. So by now, I think everybody's aware and know this, but th this all start a, a little bit with uh, the results of the astrophysics decadal survey in 2020 uh, that identified a uh, few key areas for, for research. And um, one of the outcomes from, from this report uh, was that they, they uh, suggested the, um, a, a few uh, efforts to NASA to, uh, regarding missions. They suggested a, a, a large effort to, to um, develop a flagship mission program, but also identify this, uh, this sort of gap in between the different sizes of missions uh, in between the, the middle class and the flag flagship mission class uh, and suggested there should be a call for uh, a probe that will address this this sort of a uh, intermediate place. So um, we're, we're happy to see that NASA have followed these recommendations and they early this year, they released a draft for a, a call for a, what is called a probe class mission um, again, I, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but just to remind that the few key aspects of this call, uh, they're, they're asking for a minimum of a five-year mission. It's, it's a PI-led mission, but it's, um, there is a lot of emphasis that most of the time goes to the community in, in the form of, I guess, observer program. Uh, the cost cap is about $1 billion for for. The entirety of the mission, but uh, uh, there is an additional half a billion for the um, the launch vehicle and for the geo program itself. So this is a, a, a rather unusual opportunity um, because it's the first time the NASA this is a, com a competed geo mission like this. Um, in this in this call, they're specifically asking for concepts that are either addressing. Uh, infrared or X-ray astronomy, 
And this is a, what is called a class C payload type of mission, which allows a little bit for a higher risk than a typical uh, concept of this, of this sort of size. So I'm not the right person to talk much about instruments, designs, uh, those, uh, the people behind that uh, are hopefully going to be in this call. But I did, I'm just going to give a very brief uh, idea of what the concept looks like. Um, we, um, our concept builds upon the heritage of NUSTAR, which is a hard, focusing hard X-ray um, instrument. Uh, and I'm very sorry, I cannot see the screen very well. Yeah. Um, but it will be a much larger and capable mission. So it should be seen rather than just as a bigger new star, it should be seen more as a XMM plus new star on steroids. And this is because the, the original call for the pro class was um, was require, requiring for this for these concepts to be synergetic with Athena. And um, since then things have changed quite a bit. Athena is currently going through a reformulation phase. So it is, it is unclear uh, what's, the, what's going to be the timeline for it. So this requirement no longer exists. Therefore, we have adapted our mission design in, um, to kind of uh, uh, cope with this new landscape of, of the, um, what the X-ray mission landscape will look like in the 2030s. Um, and assuming or not assuming rather than Athena and Hexby will fly at the same time. So our concept looks like now three telescopes, uh, one covering the low energy, roughly between 0 0.2 to 25 kV, and two identical uh, high energy telescopes covering from two to 150 kV for a overall coverage, very wide uh, band pass in X-rays between 0 0.2 and 150 kVs with an angular resolution that is vastly superior to that in NUSTAR and yet having the similar, a similar field of view. Uh, so you see here the key people, the uh, PI of the mission is Daniel Stern at JPL. The deputy PI is Kristen Madsen, who is now at Godar, and I'm the project scientist. Our managing center is uh, going to be JPL, but with a lot of contribution from Godar as well. So, um, we um, we have designed the mission to specifically address the key science questions that were identified in the Astro 2020 Decada report. And um, this goes roughly or broadly as uh, unveiling the drivers of galaxy uh, growth and, and also the new windows to the dynamic universe. So things that have to do with uh, time domain and multi-messenger astronomy. So it's, um, it's designed to be we like to call it the workhorse of, um, of, of X-rays. It's, it's a large facility for the 2020, for the 2030s that uh, is, we're thinking is gonna provide a bridge between the end life of Chandra and XMM. And I don't know, I know nobody wants to hear that things are coming to an end, but these are rather old missions by now. And so it's, it's bridging, it's intended to bridge the end of, of those missions with uh, the the beginning of Athena, whenever that happens, um, is, in, is designed to be a versatile facility to achieve a very wide range of scientific topics. And that's what I'm going to mostly talk about today. Um, we believe we're relatively lower risk compared to other concepts. Um, our our technologies are, um, are have been proven, are, 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 are flying right now. The current baseline design is, as I said, is built upon the heritage of NUSTAR, uh, at least for the high energy telescope. Um, the new technologies that we're considering, um, they have funding and are on, on a good track of development to reach TRL-6. And um, we have no cryogenics or, or things like that that complicate um, typical emission designs. So the, the way we have organized our science topics and, and working groups then uh, are into four main pillars in accordance to the Astro, Astro 2020 decade. And they go more or less as, you know, addressing black hole growth, uh, doing census of, of, um, of uh, objects and sur through surveys, 
um, understanding the, the extreme physics of accretion and what powers accretion in, in black holes and compact objects in general. Um, then also looking at the populations uh, for the endpoints of stellar evolution. We'll do this through look, uh, observing nearby galaxies and, and also um, uh, looking at the dynamic universe through um, multi-messenger astronomy. So uh, resolving the, the full history of black hole growth has to do with um, the fact that super massive black holes, which are obscured by, by a lot of dust, are believed to represent at least 50% of all the black hole growth. And um, due to the, to the dust that obscures them, they are inaccessible to soft X-rays or UV or optical telescopes. So this is where high X-ray uh, sensitivity becomes quite important to uncover this hidden population of, of objects. Uh, and, and, um, and you can compare that to theoretical predictions of how galaxies are formed and grow over cosmic times. Then if you go to a smaller level, uh, individual galaxies, hex, hexp will map the, the remnants of uh, exploded stars in nearby galaxies. This, of course, requires a uh, broad band pass, um, but also high resolution X-ray imaging because uh, you need to detect individual sources and then you need to understand what the populations look like uh, through a spectroscopy. And then going out to even a, a smaller scale, HEXP will, with, with the broadband X-ray spectroscopy that provides, will be key to understand uh, neutron stars at black holes. Um, and black holes can be either stellar mass all the way to supermassive, which are uh, obviously strong X-ray emitters and, and the power that goes into these processes is poorly understood. Um, the physics is extreme, the relativistic effects are typically present, and this is, these are great opportunities to, to probe all these effects. So since, since detecting the cosmic X-ray background about 50 years ago, um, resolving it and, and therefore understanding the mass accretion history in the universe has been an effort over um, a long time uh, using many instruments. And the ultimate goal is to eventually complete a census that uh, covers wide range, a wide range of range. And so we can determine how black holes grow over cosmic times and reveal the connections between the host galaxy and the larger scale environment. So higher X-rays are critical to do this. And, um, and you, you need, one of the reasons is shown in the left is because the X-ray background peaks around 30 kV. So you really need to, you know, push harder to, to harder and harder energies. So um, the figure in the left shows the cosmic X-ray background and different and, and his different components and um, and um, the determination of, of the exact shape depends on the contribution of the Compton thick population of AGMs. Below AKV, uh, about 80% of the background has been resolved already by Chandra and XMM. NUSA has managed so far to do about 35% in the, in the harder band, eight to, to 24 KVs. But then HEXP will really put this problem to rest. It will do at the very least 90% of the X-ray background, I speak. This will uh, be achieved by detecting much fainter sources uh, at a higher redshift, of course, um, given the, the larger uh, effective area that this mission will have. Um, here I'm showing uh, simulations done uh, for uh, the extragalactic surveys using what is called a survey wedding cake strategy. Um, there is a wide survey of two megasecond you can do uh, covering oh, over one degree a square, uh, doing 25 kiloseconds tilings of the entire region. And there is a deep field that will do um, a smaller, a smaller um, size, but with a much longer exposures of half a megasecond each. The simulations are done with a, a, a package called 60 that has been developed in Germany in, in the um, Rima's Observatory in Bamber. Um, and it uses catalogs, um, more catalogs that have been uh, published uh, in, the, in the recent years by different groups. 
Uh, you can see um, here the, the simulation shows the field observed by the low energy telescope from two to 10 by HEXP. Um, and and the, the, the inset on the right is the actual field of view, 13 by 13 um, square um, minutes, uh, sorry, minutes, um, arc minutes, um, which is the same field that NUSTER has. <clears throat> the source detection is done using the same techniques that you would normally apply to, to real observations currently done by NUSTER on the, the extra galactic surface by Cosmos, uh, US, UDS, and et cetera. And uh, Shiru here in CFA has done a lot of this work and is the, one of the people behind these simulations. The, the, this, this one is what the high energy telescope will see in, in the harder energies and um, running all over, over these simulations, you can now see how much deeper hex speed will be able to, to go and, and how many more sources can be detected for similar uh, surveys. So in this case, the number of sources is uh, over 500 for, for the wide field and, and 300 for the deep field surveys. The comparison uh, with NUSTAR is the NUSTAR has detected about 90 sources, 92 sources in, in a similar exposure. So many more sources will be detected Painter sources uh, will be detected. Uh, high energy snowstar has not been able to to basically do any detection. And you can see the people behind the simulations. Uh, Francesca Civano is the lead of the group that is currently doing this. In in uh, understanding accretion power, we go to much smaller scales, and there is a really wide range of physics uh, that can be addressed. High energies, um, all. Until now, we talk about mostly understanding the number of populations, but we really need to understand the physics responsible for the, the X-rays that are emitted. Um, accretion power is presumably supplied by a corona through magnetic fields that will, um, that will uh, shine into this, it will heat the disk, and it will be reprocessed. And typically, we see this, this reprocessed uh, emission and it's referred to as reflection. And there are um, tons of lines and different uh, spectral features that can be used as, as, a, as a diagnostic tool. So we can learn about the physics and geometry of this X-ray corona, but we can also learn about the structure and ionization state of the disks, of the accretion disk, for example. And, and connecting all this into a single model, we can also have information about the black hole, the, yeah, sorry, the black hole itself, like for example, his, his spin, the, the amount of angular momentum that it has. And this is a fundamental quantity, of course. Um, in the figure shown here that was prepared by um, one of my postdocs, uh, Joanna Piotrowska, um, I'm showing the current, the, probably the best um, state of the art simulations for what should be the distributions of mass versus spin for um, black holes, supermassive black holes. And, and you see three different three different um, colors. These are different uh, different simulations from different groups. The in yellow is uh, the New Horizon simulation by Du Bois, uh, 2020, 2021. Um, the only caveat with this one is that the simulation reach up to a, a redshift of about uh, 0.25, which means it hasn't reached basically the local universe. So you see is a skew or sort of limited to lower mass um, supermassive black holes that might change if that simulation is, is allowed to evolve all the way to redshift zero, I believe. And, and then there is a couple more that is the, um, the repo um, simulation um, by Bustamante and Sprinkle in 2019 shown in, in purple. Uh, covering higher masses and a very recent set of uh, simulation produced by um, Ricarda Brickman, uh, shown in green, uh, which goes to even higher masses. Um, and and this, this is done by post-processing the Horizon AGN simulations. And what I'm gonna show now is the current state of the observational constraints that we can place after basically a couple decades of observation and spectral modeling using reflection spectroscopy. Um, the points at higher masses are coming from a compilation done by Chris Reynolds 
uh, using many different sources, uh, sources of, of, of measurement of uh, different papers. And the low end mass has been, th those are results recently published by uh, one of my postdocs, Labani Malik. And you see there is there are some hints for some being able to constrain some of these distributions, but it's also uh, the uncertainties in the current measurements are quite large. So um, we still cannot differentiate between the different possibilities of the different models and, and really understand uh, which are the formation of channels for, for um, supermassive black holes to create and acquire the mass that they have in the local universe. So um, HEXP will be able to resolve this by basically having precise measurements of not only bright sources, but also fainter sources. And I'm showing here just one single simulation of a fiducial source and showing how much better the determination of black hole spin can get for a source of uh, a 10 millicrab in, in just a hundred kilosecond of exposure. So you, you reach about 5% uncertainty or better at, at three sigma for black hole spin using the same sort of model that we've been applying to XMM and user data for decades now. To understand the physics of the X-ray corona, uh, hard X-rays are also extremely important because we do that by looking at the rollover of the continuum at high energies. That rollover gives you um, the measurement of the energy, the cutoff energy gives you uh, direct information about the temperature of the corona. And the slope of the, the overall slope of the power law emission uh, and, that, and that cutoff energy will tell you um, what the optical depth is. So here I'm showing also HEXP simulations prepared by Don Walton that um, evidence how the dramatic improvement in measuring all these quantities, again, for fiducial numbers of typical AGNs. However, we, this is something that NUSA has done quite well over the, the last few years, but with HESPI, we will be able to go even deeper um, because this, these are simple models for production of, of a power law based on a thermal contonization uh, physics. And uh, it is unclear whether that the picture is too simplistic. For example, you can have a hybrid plasma in which the, the, the distribution, the electron distribution could be thermal or non-thermal. And that has been argued based on the scatter that we see in the measured temperatures for uh, our sample of sources. So this is something that we're starting to simulate with HEXP and we believe we can make that differentiation in understanding whether a simple single temperature contonization model is is enough to uh, reproduce the data or not. And these are simulations that were prepared by former postdoc of mine, Riley Corners. Um, in, in mapping the remnants of nearby galaxies, this is where the improved angular resolution of HEXP will really um, pay off uh, dramatically. And what I'm gonna show here is a simulation prepared by Brett Lemmer uh, for two galaxies, M31 and NGC 253. Uh, these are current, these are actual NUSAR observations where you're, you're seeing here, different colors and different bands. And uh, I'm gonna show now a transition to what HEXP will see with a, a factor of a few better angular resolution. The PSF will just allow us to resolve individual sources in, in these galaxies in a way that we are not able to do currently with NUSAR. Uh, but beyond this, perhaps even more important is the fact, well, let, let me show this again, because this is such a beautiful image. Um, there, there, there you go, um, changing from NUSTAR to HEXP, the same exposure, 100 kiloseconds for, M, for the bulge of M31 and, and half a megasecond for NGC 253. So um, besides this being just such a beautiful image and you can just by eye see that you're able to resolve individual sources, you can also have a spectroscopy of those sources at high energies, and that's crucial to understand uh, what type of source we're talking about to uh, catalog X-ray binaries, um, whether they are a neutron star or black holes, or even or even say what the accretion state is. Uh, you can do this by simple color intensity or color color diagrams in which you're, you're comparing fluxes in different bands. And um, you can see in this plot how much deeper HEXP will be able to sample the sources in nearby galaxies. 
uh, in the galactic center is, is such a crowded field that a similar situation occurs, right? NUSTA has been able to pierce into into the central part, central parsec region of, of such a star, but um, there is there is a lot of source confusion because of the 60 hour second PSF of NUSTAR. However, HEXPE will be able to resolve individual sources in the in this region. Pulsar wind nebula that are expected to be there versus low mass X-ray binaries versus magnetic CVs, for example. And and also very importantly, we'll be able to detect flares uh, at very high energies. <clears throat> and these are simulations done by uh, Schiffer Mandel at Columbia University. Um, I'm showing here now uh, a different set of simulations prepared by Matteo Bacchetti for the same galaxy I showed before, NGC 253, assuming a number of sources there are present and there are X-ray pulsars. And this is important for uh, people that care about ULXs and detection ah. of... Hello? Hmm. I, I heard somebody talking. Um, okay. I hope... Uh, I, ho I hope you still hear me. I hope everything's fine. Yeah, we um, okay, so um, <clears throat> so what you can see here is a simulation of the same gal the galaxy, assuming a number of X-ray sources are X-ray pulsars. And in a nutshell, what it shows is for a 100 kilosecond observation with HEXP, you can not only resolve the individual sources, but you can actually detect uh, pulsations uh, at, a, at a high degree of confidence, something that for most of the sources in the simulation NUSA will, will not be able to do. In, in talking about pulsars, cyclotron lines are very, very important because they give us a direct measurement of the magnetic field involved in, in the source. And you will see a cyclotron resonant line, typically at very high energies that goes um, as the magnetic field scales as the energy of the line. So um, this is an example I'm showing here for a low luminosity accretor. Um, this is GX304 minus one observed by NUSTAR. And there was a tentative uh, detection for a cyclotron line around 50 kV. However, um, the data was, the quality of the data was not good enough. A simulations with hex for 150 kilosecond observation of the same source show that we can constrain the line very well at a 2%. This is done by uh, work of uh, Yekaterina Sokolova lab uh, at uh, the Bamber, uh, Rimais Observatory in Bamber. Um, and intermediate luminosities, a source like VLAX1, uh, for, for a source like that, we will be able to do phase resolve spectroscopy and then now follow cyclotron lines uh, and, and beams of you know two kiloseconds or, or something like that and being able to constrain parameters to between one and 10% accuracy as shown in the simulations by Felix Fears. And a, and a higher uh, luminosity, this is a, another a good example of a source called SWIFT J0243. Um, this is uh, a source that show a long search uh, cyclotron line at very high energies at a record energy of 142 kV that was done with um, the Chinese mission HXMT. And um, we show here with simulations done by Christian Malakaria that um, XP will be able to do this. Is everything okay? Yeah, you're good, Javier. Sorry, just someone came into the, the room. Okay. I mean, the, the yeah. room. Is the... Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so. so um, you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so this will be able. We will be able to do again uh, fifty kilosecond phase resolve spectroscopy um, with HEXP uh, and, and detect these lines at very high energies because of the lower background that HEXP will have compared to NUSTAR, and then uh, allow us to go push higher in energy. So, um, obscuration is a problem that affects everyone. And clearly, sensitivity at the highest energies is, is important to address it. Um, for Compton Thick AGN, this is particularly important. There are currently about three sources Circinus, uh, NGC 4945, and NGC 1060A that are Compton Thick. Uh, 
uh, provide sensitive enough data with NUSTAR to be able to do detailed modeling yeah. of the circumnuclear environment in in and a heavily obscure AGN, right? And for for this is, and um, we're talking about having a signal to noise of about a hundred in the three to fifteen kV band, which is somewhat arbitrary, but that's kind of like what people have said that they need to to do this this sort of modeling. Um, Hexby in the simulation show in the left, we show that having the same code of, of a signal to noise of a hundred Hexby will basically able to do this for the entire population currently known of quantum thick AGNs. Um, so we're talking about doing now detailed modeling using uh, toroidal models, uh, clump measuring clumpiness and things like that. Um, in the right, these are, these are all, by the way, simulations done by uh, one of our postdocs, uh, Peter Poorman. Um, and in the right shows simulations for a single quantum thick AGN with standard um, parameters, uh, luminosity of about 10 to the 45 ergs per second, ranging over uh, different redshifts. And uh, it's showing the comparison of doing uh, a one megasecond exposure with Chandra versus a hundred kilosecond exposure with Hexby. And basically what you see is with a tenth of the time, Hexby can recover the input information in, in, in the simulation while Chandra with one megasecond um, often gets it wrong. So, so this, this shows the power of having that sensitivity, high energies. For uh, time domain and multi-messenger science, we, we also, um, we, we understand this is one of the key um, aspects of uh, the, the key science identified by the decadal. Uh, we're showing here one example of what Hexby can do in the case of, for example, um, gravitational wave detection, detections uh, and, the, and the electromagnetic counterpart. This is uh, um, simulations done by Murray Brightman of uh, GW170817. This was the very famous gravitational wave signal detected by LIGO and Virgo in 2017 that resulted as the merger of two uh, neutron stars. Uh, in, in purple, you see the Chandra spectra taken uh, 160 day, uh, days after uh, the merger. And uh, it's hard to constrain the, the actual parameters that describe this, this continuum. Hexp will have been able to see this uh, much better, will be able to constrain the flux very well, the slope of the, of the mission which provides important information about the emission mechanism itself and the geometry uh, that, that produces this. In um, next door, there is a group uh, working on, different groups working on Super Ellington Accretion. This particular group uh, led by Jane Dye in Hong Kong and simulations provided by uh, her student or postdoc, Si Jan Shang, uh, show uh, a very nice construction of a super Eddington accretor where the, the geometry is suspected to be very different from the standard accretion disk in, in, a, in a normal um, AGN or, or even in a binary, which you have a pop up uh, accretion flow. And if you're looking th through this funnel, the, they argue there is a possibility to see not only the type of reflection we see in AGNs, but you can see actually multiple reflection. And the prediction is that this multiple reflection in the walls of this funnel will have a characteristic signature in the spectra because a single reflection produces one iron emission line at a particular energy, but then the subsequent reflections will have that line shifted uh, at different energies because you're seeing the reprocessing happening at different places of the of this of this uh, this is an outflow a high velocity outflow so the because the velocities are different, the shifts are going to be different. So this shows their Monte Carlo ray tracing simulations. What's the prediction for a particular set of, of parameters in, in a source and a particular opening angle? And um, for just a 10 kilosecond observation with hex P for a one milligram source, you should be able to see that splitting of the line, that dual peak in the iron K band. Um, so this is what I've shown before, until now. This is just a, a peek of the wide range of um, scientific topics that we, we believe we're gonna be able to address very well with this mission. Uh, I'm showing here a, a 
the higher level, I guess, uh, leadership of the uh, science team structure. These are the people divided in different pillars. This is not all the people currently working and involved with it. This is just uh, mostly the leaders of the subgroups. Um, we care about trying to have a diverse uh, any, any, uh, a diverse team that also uh, pays attention to inclusivity. Of course, uh, that, that that's a uh, um, that's in the everybody's minds nowadays. And what I'm trying to do here in a, in a sort of a silly way is to show by different colors the level of seniority that we have in in our current leadership. So we're trying to involve uh, not only uh, senior people but mid career and junior as well in 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 not only in levels in low level of involvement, but also in, in, in the decision making of some of these uh, science discussions, as you can see here. Um, and uh, we also, of course, uh, paying attention to the gender balance. The current balance of just this group, which is an incomplete list, is, is not too bad, but we can, as you can see here, that some, some um, problems identify some of the pillars that we could do better in terms of gender balance. So this is something we try to pay much attention as we define our groups and define um, uh, how the mission is going to continue. So I'll, I'll like to sort of end referencing back to the mission design. What are the key components that are going to go into, into uh, trying to achieve all these science? Uh, that I just talked about, I remind you there's a low energy telescope uh, with detectors that are going to be CCD detectors um, and, and covering the 0.2 to 25 kV range. And then there are going to be two identical high energy telescopes um, with detectors similar to the ones of NUSTAR or better. Um, we're going to have a much better PSF compared to that in NUSTAR. The PSF of the low energy telescopes it should be uh, a lot better than the one in the, the, the high energy telescope because of the difference in the mirror coatings. Uh, time resolution should be similar or better than the one in NUSTAR. Uh, and as I said before, a similar field of view. We'll achieve this by having this much longer deployable boom of about 20 meters. Uh, and we know this can be done. Uh, there is a very good company that developed these extendable booms and we're working with them to make sure everything is uh, at the lowest risk, risk possible. But if you have questions about the details of the uh, design and, and instrumentation, just uh, ask me at the end. Um, and actually, this is my last slide. If you want to get involved, there's still time. We're very welcoming anybody that gets excited about this sort of mission. And if you have ideas on uh, what can be done, uh, with these instruments, please uh, let us know. We can contact us directly or go to our website. And I will stop here and I'll be happy to take questions uh, from anybody. Thanks. Thank you, Javier. So we have a question from uh, uh, in-person attendees and online uh, uh, attendees. So we start from the, the in-person one, so please. Do you want me to come up? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Javier. That was obviously great. Um, this will sound like I'm being nosy about your backdoor political, astropolitical strategizing, but I'm only kind of being nosy. Um, but I was wondering about the history of the science and architecture trade behind adding the low, en low energy telescope, because of course, pre Astro 2020, you started at 10 kV. And was that a, the addition of the soft response explicitly in response to, uh, you know, Athena reformulation news, the D scope news, or was it just a post Astro twenty twenty reconsideration of the trades. Yeah, it was it was in response to to the current you know uncertainty with with Athena. the The original idea was to have three. The original idea was to have the most area possible high energies. So it was it will be three identical telescopes all covering high energies. Uh, but given given the the current climate, as I said, and the uncertainty of when Athena will fly. Uh, we decided to repurpose one of the telescopes for the low energies. And to be honest, and this is just a very personal opinion, not the opinion of the HEXP team, but I think it makes more sense to me. Uh, we lose a little bit of area, high energies, but having the broadband uh, coverage has a huge um, advantage. If we look at, for example, the new star history of observations, about half of the new star observations have been requested with 
simultaneous observations with our low energy telescope, right? So this is a clear need of the community to have, often to have um, broadband coverage rather than just high energies. So I think it's the right, it's the right thing to do. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just a quick follow up. So um, by adding the, the LET, did you, you sacrifice some high energy area, but you also double the PSF, right? At high energy? Well, the actual number is, I, I, I don't want to quote a number, it doubled, but it's, it has to be a lot better because, well, as, uh, sorry, as I mentioned briefly, the coatings um, in, the, in the low energy mirrors are going to be different. So they degrade less the original PSF of the mirror. So we're and what's your our, so that our mirrors are are going to be the ones of Will Shang and Goddard, and he still has to come up with final numbers as well. But we believe is the mirrors themselves are going to be in the ballpark of you know two or three or seconds easily. So the degradation that comes with the with the coding is something the exact number needs to be looked at. But the numbers I'm quoting here are very conservative. We should do better than what I said. You have your, uh, do we have it, yeah, please? Hey, Javier, great talk. Um, hey, I was cur curious what your, uh, the, the total throughput is for bright sources. I know New Star caps out at about 800 a second. Do you have any sense of what's um, going to be possible with HexP? Uh, are you talking about um, telemetry limits or, 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 or something yeah. else? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, telemetry limits. I, I don't think that's, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, because we're still dealing with, you know, uh, technical aspects of, of the design, exactly which detectors are gonna, we're going to have. And the orbit is something that has been in discussion. Uh, there are different traits. So all these things are, uh, will affect, will end up affecting uh, how high you can go, I believe. Um, so no, I, I, don't, I don't have a good number. If I give you a number now, it will be probably incorrect. Hopefully, no star-like or better. Which is true for most things. We have further question for the in-person attendees. Uh, do we have any question from the online uh, participants? Uh, it seems we are good here. Uh, so thank you very much for coming and thank you, Javier. This will be our last uh, uh, seminar. i see you next semester. Thank you, Javier. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you.